Thank you. Well, I'm Barbara Horton. I am a former CEO of Horton Lee's Broadband Lighting Design, and I am very proud to have been um, a recipient of the Women in Lighting Award this year, um, particularly being uh, next to um, one of my all-time heroes, um, Toko Ishii, I, I felt super honored, actually. Um, so um, this is a great opportunity for me to share a little bit with, you know, my colleagues about my um, experiences in lighting, particularly with regard to how we mentored and grew our firm over the years. And um, so ask away. <laughs> Absolutely. And thank you very much for, for agreeing to um, be part of this and congratulations on the award. It is very well deserved. Thank you. Um, and I think the, the topic of mentorship is a, a wonderful place to start given all of your accomplishments. One of the things that I have seen firsthand and heard from so many other people and particularly women in the industry is the influence that you've had on their, their career paths. The topic of mentorship has always come up with your name somewhere in it. And so if you would like to, to start by sharing a little bit about how you got started mentoring and what that has looked like for you. Well, thanks. Um, so really when I started 40 uh, plus years ago, um, you know, the industry was dominated by mostly men in the ownership side. Um, but when you looked in the ranks, a lot of the um, staff and senior people were women. Um, and it was interesting to me, I mean, I, my, this is not my first career. I started as an interior designer where you also typically saw a lot of women, not owners, but in the ranks. Um, and so when I joined um, the lighting, Jules Horton's um, firm at the time with Stephen Lees and a few other people, there was one woman in the leadership role. And as the firm evolved and eventually in 92, when I took over as president, um, we became a WBE, or in the United States, it's a women business enterprise. Um, so it, it affords um, certain minorities and women uh, disadvantaged. Unfortunately, women are considered disadvantaged in this country um, to um, really have opportunities for projects and, um, and work that they might not have gotten because it was a boys club. So the firm uh, established itself that way. Um, and to be honest with you, it wasn't like an intention of mine that would always be support women. But, you know, I think it evolved as I saw women um, in the firm, you know, do twice as much often as what the men were doing. Um, you know, working at home, having their families, um, all of the other responsibilities and still working a full-time job. I really applauded that. Um, I wasn't a mother myself, so, um, I didn't really understand all of the trials and tribulations, you know, fully, but of course, listening to people's stories and giving people time and other um, opportunities was really important. Um, and little by little, I mean, it, you know, we just raised the bar. Um, so as Jules retired, um, Stephen and myself really became more the leaders in the company. We had a bigger vision for what it should be. Um, in 99 when, or 94, when Teal joined, you know, now we had two women, one man <laughs> in the team. Um, so, you know, it was already, we were already seeing opportunities to raise that bar. Um, and yeah, I just felt like it was very important to give women opportunities, not just as designers in the firm, but truly give them leadership roles and responsibilities. Um, and so I think there was a time when we were all women, except for Stephen and the ownership team, you know, Carrie and Tina and Lee and others. Um, and at some point we had one or two men in there. Um, uh, I think we realized that um, we had maybe created a, a, as I described, a stainless steel ceiling for men uh, to uh, uh, become leaders in the firm. And it became very obvious to us. Um, it probably in the last, recently in the last 10 years. Um, so while we are still a WBE, Women Business Enterprise, um, in terms of majority of ownership, we do have a nice balance now, uh, even on the board, um, where there are 
uh, three men and well, two men now and the rest women. Um, and one thing that's really interesting is that the whole dynamic changes, um, the conversation, um, the methods in our communication. Uh, so, you know, having observed a kind of almost all woman board with the exception of Stephen for years, and then that slow transition to start bringing in some of the other voices, um, I think just, you know, enriched the firm uh, in a way that I hadn't thought about or had seen before. So I think it was really great. And we're now very conscious of making sure that we have a, a, a good balance of um, uh, all, all voices, men, women, and other um, in the organization so that we are being responsive and staying current and, and thinking about next generation, you know, who, who is in the ranks that is going to now be the future leaders of the company and, you know, not be concerned about just WBE uh, or just women uh, really create. I think we've just matured. We finally grew up, you know, um, I, I guess that's how the best way to describe it. It's, I mean, it's impressive because you, the Women in Lighting Project has, as one of its missions to promote gender parity in uh, judges, judge panels and speaker panels and just sort of general representation. And you've already been doing that much earlier than most people. And so you've, you've sort of gone through that process ahead of others. Yeah. Um, and, I, I, and that was I, just natural. I, it's not right. like we planned it. It was just observation and, and recognizing talent and making sure that we're doing the right thing for everyone. And is there anything that you learned in terms of the, of the communication styles, how those differ that you then use in your, your mentoring of, um, of talent as they came in or as, as you were fostering? That's a, that's a really good question. Um, women tend to be um, more um, problem solvers. Um, they are mediators. They're really good at mediation. Obviously, you know, I could um, assume that, you know, have three kids and you've got to mediate between all three, you know, or whatever. But um, I think they're really good at that. Women are good mentors, you know, in a lot of respects. Um, and nurturing uh, as well. Um, men are a little bit more um, formal, you know, that, that added that other layer to it. Um, we, could, we could go off on a tangent and talk about one topic and, and have six different avenues and then, you know, never really come to a conclusion sometimes. But um, as the men filtered into it, it got a little, I, I think that's the best way to describe that, a little bit more formal. Um, tr you know, tremendous mutual respect on both sides, which is really important. And that goes not just for like our board meetings and our shareholder team, but, you know, the team itself. Um, so, you know, we're working side by side with everyone. And um, yeah, men, men are more interested in let's have an agenda, you know, let's, you know, keep the time. <laughs> and women just sort of go off on, on their conversations and anecdotal stories and you know, stuff like that. And by the way, I didn't observe that directly. It was, the mirror was held up to me at one point mm -hmm. with an outside observer who joined a couple of our meetings and said, do you realize you always have to, you know, not you, but we, um, the women in the group sort of always go off and have to tell another tangential story. <laughs> so, and yeah, so, yeah. And that was a man, by the way, just saying. <laughs> um, I mean, I think it, it's, it's very uh, helpful to get that feedback. Was it hard to hear it? Was it? Would... No, I think I've always been realistic, you know, and to be honest with you, when you're in the weeds in the middle of a meeting, it is hard to see yourself or to observe what's really going on. Um, so I think, you know, as you know, we've, we have a history of management consultants and outside advisors for whatever the needs were when we needed them. Um, you know, sometimes it was giving us better communication skills. Um, sometimes it was the financial side of things. So I think having I think because I grew up with advisors, men and women at various stages in my career and in the firm, um, I guess I always looked for that reflection um, on what we were doing well and what we could 
you know, it greatly improved. So um, yeah, no, it was not hard at all. <laughs> it, it seems to me as an outsider that that part of HLB's sort of value in, in seeking reflection and seeking ways to continually improve either from sharing with, you know, designers sharing with each other, having outside consultants has always been part of the ethos. Was that from the start? Where did that come into? Well, it started with when I came into the firm as um, the, an, actually before I became an owner. Um, so, you know, Jules and Jules Horton and Stephen Lees were the two partners. Um, and I kept, you know, banging on the door. <laughs> can, I, can I be, can I be an owner? Um, I was, you know, in my early thirties and everyone, oh, as I've said before, Stephen said, just, you know, knock down that door. Don't just keep knocking on it, just knock it down. And so one of the first things I did was, um, I, you know, I guess I had some aspirations for, um, not to have a pop and pop shop. <laughs> um, and so I had read an article about a man from a management consultant in one of the architectural magazines. And I was fascinated by what this guy was saying. And I could see, you know, those same uh, concerns, you know, were evolved, had evolved in our business as well. Um, and so I convinced Stephen and Jules to hire this management consultant. It was a three day you know, thing, and he did a survey with all the team members at that time. I think there were two offices and maybe thirteen people, <laughs> um, and um, and his his consulting fee was, you know, probably the cost of our or, or the size of our profits. And so Stephen and Jules were like, no, 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 we're not doing that. So anyway, long story short, I, I you know, kind of proved that we could pay for this consultant in one year's time by uh, doing some little. Um, service that would make it work and they were skeptical but okay uh, of course they wanted a successful firm too so um, that management consultant came in and that was really the history I mean and after that I realized I what I don't know about running a business or any of us we're all designers we've been you know geared to design uh, aesthetics problem solving, you know, and yes, you know, we hired the right people to do our payroll and finances and things like that, but it's not the same as, you know, having a big vision for running the company. And the idea of this consultant, you know, really sometimes holding up a very serious mirror and telling you what you're doing wrong. You know, in fact, honestly, I just unearthed the document, you know, 26 pages of everything we were doing wrong, uh, written on a manual typewriter. Um, but it helped us also create a vision for the future. So, you know, in 1999, I also found that document. I shared it with Carrie. I was so proud to look at what we established then and how mm. we got there. And, you know, we didn't do it exactly in the same time frame or whatever, but we reached those goals. We got set to seven offices, you know, things like that. So, um, yeah, I think have, you know, one of the biggest advice that I had for many of my colleagues was, um, and I wish I had done it earlier, but get a CFO or COO in your firm so that you could do what you do best design and not have to deal with all of the day-to-day -day, um, operations issues. And, you know, the bigger you get, the more concerns there are, the more compliance you have to do. Um, the more nurturing and caring that you have to do for your staff. You know, everybody is a free agent. And as you know, it's a, it's a small industry. Everybody knows each other. And so keeping people happy and, um, you know, engaged um, and feel like owners was kind of the goal for us. And I think one of the proudest moments I had in, um, as I was growing in the business was when a young man who I think had been with us for about a year and he came and he said, you know, I'd really want to test this market sector. We don't have a lot of work in it and I'd like to really pursue it. And I was like, let's do it. You know, like, show me what you got and put a great plan together, opened up doors to firms and some projects that, you know, we would have never even pursued if that person hadn't tried to do it. And um, I remember one day he came to me and he says, you know, I, the one thing that I love about this firm is I feel like an owner. And I was like, oh my gosh, that's what we wanted. We want everybody to feel like the CEO. <laughs> so um, everybody, you know, from the, you know, 
director of first impressions, our receptionist to the CEO, he, you know, it wasn't Kool-Aid necessarily, but it was having an excitement about what you're doing and, and what you're building and what you're designing and what you're doing for other people in our industry um, and in our world was um, kind of the big focus, but, um, you know, giving people some empowerment and some autonomy to do things was, um, you know, that's what was given to me and I was giving it to others. You specifically said nurturing and care. And I don't, I, if we're talking within the context of the Women in Lighting Project, those are not words that you would typically hear when you're talking about business. And I think that they fall under, you know, they fall under a sort of more gendered um, experience. They're, they're more of a woman realm experience, mm. but I think it, it doesn't necessarily need to be that way. And I think, in fact, it, it, it seems to, typically when we talk about nurturing being part of, of a workplace or a business place, it has, it, it's beneficial to everybody. You've already answered, in fact, how you sort of pushed down the door that basically you took on um, a project or a, a goal that you really wanted to go after and you did it and you found that that was successful and it's something that you're proud of. And it's, it's really wonderful to hear that. How do you see if there's any connection to that being part of you as a woman in the lighting industry wanting to try something that the men hadn't tried or that was not as like a typical route for. Yeah, got it. Um, you know, I, I wonder as you're with, were um, mulling over that question, whether it was generational versus a man versus women. Um, mm -hmm. So, you know, the, gen the earlier generation jewels, um, you know, David Mintz, um, Ray Grinald, Leslie Wheel, they, they were true entrepreneurs and they, you know, nothing stopped them. <laughs> um, I think by the time, I, so I kind of see myself as like maybe like third generation um, because there was a, a group in between that, you know, um, are a little bit older than me. Um, that um, I think we, saw the mistakes of some of that older generation, whether they were men or women, um, and wanted to do something different. And I think the IALD certainly for me was a big eye opener in trying to raise the bar, raise the sense of what's this profession about. And again, not gender specific, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so I think, you know, you could sort of look back to oh, I'm gonna say maybe 20 years ago where so many more women were getting involved in that leadership role, their own companies. Um, some of them spawned by us, you know. Um, I, when I see that list after our 50th anniversary of 450 people that have walked through our doors over 50 years, I was astounded. But then I was so proud to see how many actually have started their own company, men or women. And um, so I, I do think that that's more the situation is that we, 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 again, we're having a certain growth, you know, we were now teenagers in this profession and mm -hmm. giving it a little bit more um, edges as opposed to the, you know, bon vivant, you know, whatever, you know, goes, um, you know, like for Jules, he didn't even know where the staplers were. He had no, like no clue. <laughs> You know, um, you know, I, I, I've shared the story where, you know, he went and took a loan out to give a bonus, Christmas bonuses, you know, because he hadn't made the profits that year. I mean, that's caring, right? Stupid, but it was caring. Um, and so there's a great lesson. We said, we're never going to do that. You know, we're never going to ever go without a paycheck where, you know, no one in the firm will ever do that. And I think those are the things that inspired not just me, but, you know, the team. And I think, again, my generation, when I, I look at some of my um, friendly competition, you know, they, I think they have the same goals and the same attitude and have been successful because we learned from that earlier generation what not to do. Thanks for mulling through that question. That's, 
<laughs> much more <laughs> I hope, I, hope I answered it <laughs> no I think it's it, it's great and I do I do appreciate also referencing sort of um sort of a generational sort of placing yourself within a generation of the architectural lighting history but then uh wondered if you could also speak about your mentors you mentioned Leslie Wheel as um as one of the people in that very lovely list but are there others that you could share about? Well, I mean, certainly Jules, um, you know, he was uh, teaching lighting at FIT. That's how we met. Um, I went on to for a couple of years as an interior designer. And then at one point, one of his colleagues called and I had left my job and was kind of floundering. I don't know what to do next. And she called me. She said, I need someone to come draft. And I was like, OK. And, you know, three weeks there turned into three months turned into 30 years I mean you know like I don't really know what happened um but what I do recognize is that I saw a um opportunity that I might not have had in a more established profession like interior design or architecture as a woman and so this I think was the the big inspiration for me so Jules definitely you know got me in the door um certainly the um, concept of um, both the science and the art of lighting was really intriguing for me because as an interior designer it was always so subjective you you know we picked a color and I would do this presentation to a client and the client would say I hate brown and you're like okay well you know here was the re here was the rationale for that color but it didn't matter he didn't like brown so and lighting was just so ethereal and so um you know, I, I think probably most, of, as I was being educated, I was educating others. Um, and I was speaking from that interior designer point of view that um, helped them not take the sort of scariness out of lighting. And so I think that um, if you could bring a, a scary or tech, a high technology thing or anything that with electricity to an interior designer or an architectural team in words that they understood, it just made it much more fun. And so that's really what made me stick with it because I was learning and teaching all at the same time um, and creating. I mean, it was pretty wild um, and creating so many different kinds of projects, interior and exterior. I would have never had that opportunity if I had stayed solely in uh, as an interior designer. And, and I will also say that as, with Jules being a, a good mentor, um, as I was still working as an interior designer, he, uh, you know, I was learning by osmosis about lighting, right? I was living, eating, breathing, lighting. And I would finish a project in, in my interiors firm and I'd realize, I don't know, there's, there's something isn't right. And I could never figure out what it was. And then it wasn't until I took some classes with Bob Prowse at, at um, and then of course, you know, Jules inviting me to come into the firm that I started to realize, ah, I knew what that missing ingredient was. You know? So I think when other people, came, and so I did not come in with a lighting degree, you know, everybody today has a master's in lighting and, and more PhDs and, and whatever. Um, you know, I had to learn by plugging and unplugging and blowing things up and trial and error and, you know, understanding the fundamentals and all that kind of stuff. But it was all through that visual experience that um, I think was really important. And so those are the kinds of things. It wasn't so much I was teaching other people in my firm about lighting. They could probably teach me more. In fact, they did teach me more. But um, I, we we taught each other about how to see and how to experience things and how to feel it. And you know, it wasn't just putting circles and squares down on a piece of paper. It was like, what do we want this space to feel like or look like? And and then working with those architectural teams to make it happen. So definitely Jules was that the inspirator there. Um, and I'm gonna say Steven, I mean, honestly, they were the two closest people in my career. Um, so, you know, I walk in, I don't know, calculus, I don't even know what a computer is, you know? <laughs> and here I am doing Lumen Micro, which probably nobody even remembers, um, you know, it was totally crazy bizarre, and I have to say that, you know, Stephen was extremely patient, understood what I didn't know, and, um, you know, pushed me a lot to ex go outside of my comfort zone, and I think that because those were 
things that were shared by to, you know, with me to, in my career and somebody took a chance, I constantly brought that same um, attitude to everybody else. Um, and yeah, I remember, you know, a couple of interns coming in and you just see that spark, but their parents want them to be an electrical engineer or an astronaut or a ballerina or whatever they wanted. And I would just, you know, work it until I could get somebody to really be excited and be inspired by what they were doing and on whatever level they were interested in. So um, I think I always tried to give back. And that was something I, I really learned from, you know, Stephen and Jules particularly. About your, your route to becoming a super mentor. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, you find the right people you give them all the ingredients and then they go make the soup. I mean, basically. <laughs> <laughs> and I had to give a lot of credit to um, Lee Brandt, who's, you know, one of the principals in the firm. You know, I think as, as our team was growing, everybody was kind of looking for um, a place where they could um, be influential in the company, you know, not just doing great work, not just design, but what else can I contribute? And that was definitely my, you know, my inspiration is what else can you do? There's, you know, so many things to running a business and growing a business. Um, and Lee really took on the leadership in, in the absence of an HR person to um, create and develop a real mentor program, um, a, as we call it, blueprints, um, a structure to, you know, promote and to grow in the firm. And it's, you know, and maybe it sounds a little like the military sometimes, but I think you people want to know well, where can I go? What's my path? And so not only are we um, doing kind of one on one nurturing and mentoring and sponsorship, but we're also showing people the big, the longer path to success. And then they choose to go that route or not, you know, um, and I think that's what's made us so successful in getting people to come back to the firm. Because, um, you know, whatever the reasons were that someone leaves, um, economics, uh, you know, family moves out of state, whatever, they, um, or they just don't like us anymore, or they're not inspired. I mean, it happens, right? We, yeah. We've seen it. Um, and, you know, we've lost some very valuable people because we didn't have our eye on the ball, you know, for that particular situation. But what I'm so proud of is that when people do come back, it's, it's with a really good foundation of what other firms are like or what their own, you know, if they ran their own firm and then decided to, to um, come back to HLB, um, there's something, there's gotta be some magic in there that, you know, is, is giving them the incentive to wanna return and grow. It's not yeah. that they just returned, but they, they take on another dimension of the firm. And I think what I'm most excited about is, you know, watching so many of the people that, um, we did mentor. Now, you know, Carrie's a good example as the new CEO of the company. Um, 20 some odd years ago when she came into the office for an interview, you know, I, I guess my, I would say, you know, I looked at her and said, she's got all the right things. Like, let's see where that goes. But there were others too, you know, but you always, every time you're interviewing somebody, you're always looking for, or should be looking for your replacement, right? <laughs> That's my big advice. Look for your replacement. Um, yeah. So what is, you know, 10 years or 15 or 20 or 25 years look like from now? So as we look at our, our next generation, next, next generation, I don't know, whatever they're called. Um, we are, we're looking at who, who will replace Carrie. What is our industry going to look like in 10 years, 20 years? Um, and what will be needed? You know, maybe it's not even a designer who leads the company. Maybe it's the IT team you know I mean I just um I can envision a real a big transformation not just in the way we do our business and our our you know lighting profession but I could see easily um the whole mentality the rethinking of who runs the company and why why is that important so you know we've got virtual reality and um I don't even know what's coming <laughs> Well, looking forward, is there, I have a question in terms of what elements or sort of current practice do you think that we should be documenting and preserving for future generations? Is there a need to know history and context to be able to 
continue practicing lighting? Well, I clearly I think there's some very basic fundamentals. You know, it's it's sad to me. You know, I've been through four technology changes in my career, um, and it's sad for me to see um, people that have never really experienced what incandescent light did. Um, it, it had its limitations, clearly. But um, it was funny when we had to do a project overseas and the mandate was told for all incandescent. And I was like, oh my God, I can be useful. <laughs> this is awesome. Um, but people didn't know what a PAR lamp did or an, you know, an MR16. So because they grew up in compact fluorescent and now LED. So I do think that there's um, some great benefit to understanding that history. And I remember going to a lecture by Dave Delora some years ago where he, you know, I mean, he took us back to fire and it was fascinating. And it was fascinating yeah. because you think of how lighting has evolved all of these, you know, years um, and what, what provokes us, what inspires, what makes us, you know, change our emotions, right? Uh, to, from fear to warmth, to love, to whatever. So I do, uh, you know, advocate whoever is teaching um, that they really um, always look to that history. Um, and, you know, will we ever replicate that? I mean, will my four-year-old grandson have any idea, you know, what that was about? No, but we've moved on, right? He'll, he'll have his own experiences in whatever way we can, this, my generation can still, get, you know, maintain them. Um, so I think, yeah, I, I do think you need to, um, you know, not just the fundamentals of light and all of that, but, and then I think we start, we need to start really thinking about the technologies and the internet of things and everything that's, you know, going to be coming at us, uh, the virtual reality, because it's going to be a part of that future generation very clearly. And I know it's hard for me to like envision it and see, well, how would we walk a client through a space and really have them feel and experience light before we build it? But it's happening already. We're, I'm seeing stuff being produced by our office and architects and others that, um, you know, just sort of take us out of our daily life into this other world. And I, I think it's really exciting. And I have, did, do you recall seeing the um, presentation by the uh, young woman, I can't remember her name, uh, from Pixar at any one of the ILD conferences? I mean, she didn't have any lighting background and she just was an animator and she had to go study light. And, you know, just think about her experience um, yeah. going to these places and really seeing and absorbing and everything. I mean, that's almost the fundamental of what every lighting designer should be doing and learn the technology. <laughs> Yeah. Observation first. Yeah. And Being experience it. Yeah. yeah. Light light is so experiential and having, you know, I even, like I said, you know, seeing it with my grandson, I had this little sphere with color change and he picks up the control and he's, you know, already a lighting designer. Right. Um, but he's so fascinated by all of that. And yeah. I thought this is, you know, I'm watching him be quite, you know, questioning it. How does, is it magic? What's inside that ball? You know? kind of stuff. It's exciting. Oh, I think this is a great segue into what excites you about light. So you you described very beautifully that part of the amazing part of being an architectural lighting designer is being able to make tangible this very ethereal uh, mm -hmm. thing that we all experience, but having access to it with vocabulary, with um, technology, all of these ways that we sort of can get into uh, something that I, I, I just find incredible to be able to have as part education, light, science, art, all combined into one. So given that when you describe it, it makes me excited. I wanted to ask you, is there anything like what's, if you can recall the first moment that you realized prior to, to sort of joining the firm or your lighting class, excitement or passion around light? Well, you know, it's interesting because it had nothing to do with electric light because honestly, I didn't even know that that existed or as a profession, you know, you just, yeah. as you grew up, you turned to switch on, light was on, light was off. Um, 
so definitely my interior design training started making me think about the experience and how light could make a difference. Yeah. Um, and, but I would say probably I was more influenced by nature, light in nature, because that's what we first see and experience. And it's so interesting. Um, I remember it, while I was um, at FIT being fascinated by daylight and daylight studies, of, of course, they weren't offering that as an interior design class. <laughs> so I had to go learn on my own. And it was really, I, I wasn't interested in learning like the, the calculation to do something or whatever. I was really more interested in, well, how does the sun, you know, reflect on the building? What happens when it comes through the glass? You know, what happens if the glass changes? So all of the things that um, as an interior designer, I was concerned about how natural light was gonna impact that. Uh, experience in space. And it's so funny because I never did any daylighting uh, that was relegated to so many other people on the firm. And now, of course, we have a whole studio. Um, but I intuitively understood, even if I, you know, and I could read a calculation and understand why it was doing the wrong thing or the right thing, but, um, you know, never really actually got into the mechanics of it. And I think funny as my career, you know, continued, I spent a lot of time outdoors sailing um, and watching the cycles, you know, as we sailed overnight from, you know, one place to another, watching sunrise, going through the whole day, going back to sunset, watching the stars, watching the aurora borealis. I mean, that was like, oh my God, there's so much more than just electric light <laughs> that, um, you know, many people don't experience, especially if they live in big cities. So I think that's always been my inspiration. Um, and to be honest with you, in some ways that kind of moved me more towards um, out uh, exterior place, place making um, projects. So parks and monuments and things like that, because I realized that's when you could bring many people together to extend their day to um, experience natural light as well as um, electric light or, um, you know, that enhanced it in some way. So um, I think, yeah, na nature has probably been the biggest inspiration for me and continues to be. Um, I, it's funny, I'm living in Florida now and we face west on one of our balconies, um, east and west actually, east, west and north, but the western sky in Florida is like, a, it's like a light show. It's every night and whether it's thunderstorms or, you know, the sunsets or whatever. So cloud formations. Um, one day uh, during the, in the middle of COVID, I was out in my kayak because I was getting, you know, feeling so confined. And at one point I just sort of was resting and I look back on, I'm in Biscayne Bay and I look up and I see a, a Corona around the sun and these cloud formations that are just floating. I just picked up my cell phone and I shot a whole bunch of pictures. And I sent them back to Stephen, who wasn't with me. I was all by myself. And I was like, I don't know what that was, but it was awesome. And as I shared those pictures with friends, they were just like, you are such a lighting designer. Like I wouldn't have even looked up. I'm kayaking, you know, we're doing whatever. And I just took in that moment to, and just, by luck, happened to see something that was really rare and amazing and beautiful. With, I, it fills me with such joy because it's the same thing that motivates and inspires me. And so it's just the people who are in lighting and who love lighting and who are love lighting dorks, there's, it's, yeah. it, it really does bring joy. Um, yeah, and you see it all, you know. Yeah. Um, so. I think, um, let me see, what else might have been inspiring for me? Um, you know, I think just once I got into the business and, you know, like I said, blew things up, doing mock-ups, um, testing ideas, you know, I had that strong foundation of understanding materials um, and um, seeing how light interacted with materials became really like... Um, like Disneyland, you know, like, oh my God, look what we could do. And, and again, sharing that with architects, like when they would come to you and say, oh, I'd really like to have an opaque, you know, blah, blah, blah. And you're like, I know, but light, it, opaque, you know, trying to explain opaque does mean that no light goes through it, right? So, and showing and demonstrating um, what the, you know, how powerful light is in the 
in especially with materials and form. Um, I think that was the most exciting part of my job, um, you know, and then, you know, then the rest was writing the spec and doing all this stuff and making sure it worked. But um, yeah, just kind of revealing what I can do was like the biggest ex excitement for me. And I see that with everybody. We're, we're all like that. We're kind of, you know, junkies <laughs> when it comes to what we could do with that light, <laughs> including little puppet shadow, shadow puppet shows. <laughs> Oh, it, it really, it brings me such joy. And all of this to say that you're also doing this interview while there's, you know, thunderstorm and little lightning show outside your window. <laughs> I know, it's, it is crazy out there. But a lightning is actually, I mean, one night Stephen and I were just sitting in bed and we have a glass bedroom with glass on, in the corner. And I just like lifted all the shades and like, I want to watch this whole thing because it was amazing all around us. So yeah, it's exciting. It's not so exciting when you're on a sailboat and you're in the middle of it, but <laughs> well, I mean, it's exciting, but it's also terrifying. <laughs> well, I wanted to just ask a couple more questions before we, we finish. I have, one of them was just to understand sort of you have offices, uh, HLB has offices throughout the United States and we have work everywhere, but is there, um, outside of the United States, is there a community of, of lighting designers or other lighting related uh, organizations that have influenced you or that you've been a part of? Um, well, ILD certainly was the big one, you know, the international community. Um, you know, I was very privileged to be on the board twice and run for president and <clears throat> all the responsibilities that go with that. And I was president at a time when there was a you know, pretty big upheaval in the world of lighting design and um, really had the opportunity um, through ILD to travel around the world, uh, literally a round trip. Um, starting with Japan, Singapore, Australia, making my way around to Europe. Um, and I did that a couple of times. I met some amazing people. Um, uh, in Europe, particularly Scandinavian countries were amazing. But I have to say, um, I believe that I was Japanese in my former life because I have such an affinity to the Japanese culture, food, music, everything, art. Um, and when I met uh, uh, Kiro Mende, Mende-san, uh, his firm is in, uh, I think, Singapore and, well, of course, Tokyo. Um, I, I, what can I say about him? Um, he's a teacher and he teaches people to see, you know, that's what I was talking about earlier. So I really admire how he on an annual basis takes his group and they go out and they study light. And then they put these beautiful books together of what they've observed. Um, I, I'm so honored when I get one of those every year because it's just so, so beautiful and so touching. Um, and I think what um, Mende San does also is he delights us with his work. I, I mean, if I could turn back the clock and start my career again, I would go work for Mende San. <laughs> um, because think just, I, I look at this portfolio and of course I've actually experienced some of the projects that he's done. Um, they are always, um, they always delight. I mean, that's really, you know, there's, there's the artistry and the science, it's very evident, but there's this smile on your face when you see it done. So, and as a person, he's so humble and, you know, uh, gentle and truly, truly a mentor, which I think is amazing. Um, and, you know, because I'm very business oriented, I would say he runs a really great practice as well. So not only is he, you know, nurturing another generation, delighting all of us, um, but he's also built a really strong practice and a, f and a future for lighting designers, not just in Japan, but, um, you know, around the world. So yeah, if I could turn back the clock, I'd go work with Mende Sun. <laughs> oh, my. Uh, I now would like to <laughs> go outside and study some light. <laughs> you would, okay. The, the I hope you're having better weather than we are. <laughs> the light is really, really key. Um, I also, I guess, looking forward, wanted to ask if there 
you know, other than spending time sailing, what are, are things that you are, are hoping to do in the next, let's say, couple of years? What's, what's on your, um, your plate, lighting or not lighting related? Yeah, so I've been painting. Um, I actually sort of renewed my relationship with paint <laughs> um, during COVID because I was going stir crazy. Um, and I had a ton of canvases that, you know, at one point somebody said, you know, you can just paint over those and start all over. And I was like, what a great idea. And I think because I'm living in a different environment now from New York, now here in Miami and surrounded by water, I mean, everything just kind of came together for me. Um, so yeah, I've been doing a lot of paintings. I think the year, the, the one single year during COVID, I did eight paintings, um, most of which ended up with family and friends. Um, I've got three or four in the works um, and I'm using um, light as a touch, you know, like, so it's, it's very moody and it, you know, but somehow light gets, it creeps into some of these things, which is great. Um, I don't think they're so great, but I mean, I'm having fun. I really don't care. Uh, <laughs> I don't care if you like it or you don't like it, I'm having fun. Um, and um, yeah, I'm, I'm hoping that we, Stephen and I will get a little bit more involved in some um, opportunities to do more education, um, offer opportunities to share what we've done over the years with um, the next generation or even the current generation. Um, so there may, may be some things in the works that um, we can share and talk about in another interview in the future. And yes, sailing is in there. Sailing is definitely sailing. in there. We, um, we are almost ready with the boat. Um, COVID has definitely put a kind of crimp in our style. We were hoping in October to uh, head down to the BVI, but they're not living in uh, cruisers. So we'll wait till next year. You know, it's not a big deal. Life, we're, we're still healthy. We're still vibrant and ready to go. And, uh, and then the big plan would be to take the boat across back to France or Portugal or somewhere and spend some time in Europe in the future. So, yeah. I look forward to that for you. <laughs> oh, good. Thank you. Thank you. Maybe you'll meet us there. <laughs> yes. Uh, happily. <laughs> yeah. So I'll do, I'll do a conference in Europe uh, by boat. <laughs> oh, yeah. I, yes. I would love to, to join you. I think you could do um, the skies of Europe or or some other thematic. <laughs> yeah. I don't know if I'll be I painting could. on the boat. That probably won't happen. But I did watercolor for a while because it was easier to manage. You know, while we, we lived on a sailboat for a number of years. So, you know, life was very different, but very exciting. And talk about experiencing our environment. That was a, a great way to do it. Um, is there anything else that you'd like to share that I haven't asked or touched on? Um, no, I just, uh, I think this is really fun. And um, I really appreciate, again, you know, being recognized. Um, and uh, I, I've had a wonderful career. I hope that everybody has as good of an experience as I have. Um, and, you know, one thing I would say is, well, yes, it's hard work. And there's lots of, you know, days when you just want to put that box over your head and scream. <laughs> um, there's so many joyous days too. And take advantage of every single day. Um, look for, you know, what could you do with some that's not such a great situation and how can you make that into a better situation, whether it's for yourself or for someone else. Um, and certainly apply that into your design work when you're thinking about spaces and opportunities and you know, you know, the architect or the interior designer or the landscape architect doesn't quite like your idea just put that in the design bank for the next project because it's still a good idea. It's just not right for this moment, you know? So that would be my suggestion is just try to have as much excitement and joy and pleasure out of doing the work that we'd love to do. Thank you so much. Trevor, this is wonderful. Um, it's a great way for me to, to continue my, my week and my day. Um, and I really am, you know, we'll say even not having a lot of um, of direct experience together. I'm really grateful to have had interactions with you in the industry. It's uh, great. And, 
And likewise. <laughs> well, who knows? If you ever need a mentor, just give me a call. <laughs> Thank you so much. You take um, care. Take care, Barbara. Have a wonderful afternoon, hopefully with better weather or you can enjoy the light show. Exactly. <laughs> okay, take care. Take care. Bye. Bye-bye.